Um, so like <clears throat> Dick said, I'm going to elaborate a little bit on the, the numerical model results uh, for OSO. Um, let's see if this might. Uh, so, so I'm going to start off first by, by uh, elaborating on the results of OSO. And then later I'll give uh, a little more detail about the mathematical model and the software uh, DCLAW. Um, but of course, for, for full details, uh, you should consult the, the papers that we just published. Um, <clears throat> so a, a few days after the OSO event, uh, it was suggested that the DCLAW simulations might actually be useful in the recovery effort. And <clears throat> the idea was uh, that they might provide maps for the recovery workers, but mostly just to give them an uh, indication of how far houses might have been transported by the flow so that they would uh, have a better idea of where to look rather than where the, the houses were previously. Um, I wasn't sure how useful this would be, but, but, uh, uh, but nevertheless, we needed to perform the simulations fairly quickly. Um, so we, didn't really, we couldn't really do uh, an in-depth investigation of model sensitivity to material parameters. So it was sort of a quick effort to just try to get something that's reasonable. So as Dick mentioned, we, to initiate the, the numerical model, we of course need a, a failure volume. Uh, the model doesn't determine that. We have to input that into the model. Um, but as, as was mentioned, uh, uh, we couldn't have had it better because we had 2013 and 2014 LIDAR. But nevertheless, because there was still, uh, uh, there's still material in the source region, as Dick said, we couldn't just difference those. So we created a failure surface. Um, these are the three different options we had, and we went with the, with the middle one, which was 8.3 uh, million cubic meters. Um, so this, here's an oblique view of the simulation with that, that, uh, that source volume. Now, of course, we can't perfectly simulate the sequence of events and the initiation that, that Kate will elaborate on next, but the, you know, the basic goal is just to get uh, a feel for the, for the runout behavior after that initiation sequence. And you may have noticed uh, at the top there's some early spreading laterally of really thin material, but that, that's because of the, at the top of the, the failure surface it crowns backward a little bit. And because we just initiate things simultaneously in the model, there's a really thin layer of material that flows that direction. But for the most part, uh, the, the, the runout predicted by the model was reasonable um, given the, the field evidence of the, of the runout. Um, so this, this was fairly quickly put together with parameters that we just estimated from experiments at the, at the debris flow flume. And uh, we just went with it without doing any sort of parameter. Uh, we didn't do a, a thorough study of, of uh, parameter sensitivity, but we want to do that in the future. Um, except for the, for the initial porosity, which we knew the model would be sensitive to because of, of uh, this, this process where it can contract and liquefy or not contract and stabilize. So in the two alternative simulations that were shown, uh, these are the material parameters in the model. Um, all of the ones in black were identical for those two simulations, uh, and only the initial porosity was, was varied. So in the, uh, the, the simulation that was shown in the previous slide, we have an initial porosity that's only 2% uh, looser than in this denser case. Um, but the, the important thing really is the difference between uh, the initial porosity, so, so M here is our, our solid volume fraction, and M naught's the uh, initial solid volume fraction. But we also have in the model a, a, a critical state porosity, which is uh, the quasi-static uh, uh, critical solid volume fraction such that there will be no contraction or dilation upon shearing. So when, when our initial porosity is slightly larger than that, that uh, supports contraction and liquefaction, and we get a, a, a large, large runout versus just a, a slumping. So uh, we'll just revisit this that was shown in, in the last talk. Uh, so on the left, uh, the initial solid volume fraction and the critical solid volume fraction are equal. And here it's 2% looser. And I'll, hopefully this will work. But so in, in this, this first case, we have the non-contractive slumping. Can barely see that. Oh. Ah, media player's not set up. Well, um, let's try this one more time. It worked in the it worked in the speaker. There we go. All right. <laughs> so, so notice it does fail. 
and, uh, and it slumps and it, it just barely crosses the river, I guess. And notice the, the time scale here. It's, it's already at 300 seconds or so. It's easier for me to look at this one. And then in the, in the case where the material is slightly looser, which promotes contraction and liquefaction, of course, we get We get liquefaction of much larger runout, which more reasonably reproduces what was, what was observed. Um, now I'll just go back to this slide, uh, these slides. So, so we know the model, of course, depends on these parameters, but it's, but it's not particularly sensitive to these, these parameters. Um, other than the, this, this initial porosity and critical porosity, and probably the next most uh, sensitive, the, the next parameter in the, in the, uh, that's most, that it's most sensitive to is the hydraulic permeability. So, so here, what, I've, what this shows here is the inundated area, each one of these curves is a different simulation. Um, the two lowest curves here are material that's dilative or non-contractive, and they, they essentially lie on top of each other. So what happens is the material slumps, it inundates you know, expanding area, but then it pretty much stops and, and uh, is stable after 20, 30 seconds or so. And each one of these curves here, um, <clears throat> we're varying the, the, the difference in this, this quantity here so that it's becoming more contractive. So as you can see, it, it expands to larger areas as we uh, uh, increase this uh, degree of uh, contractivity. Um, the simulation that was shown in the previous slides is actually this red one here the one that has liquefaction and run out. Um, so there's only two non-contractive cases here, but if, if I were to put much more on here, they would essentially lie on this same, this same curve here. So we see this bifurcation where we cross this zero point um, in the difference between the, the initial solid volume, fraction, solid volume fraction and critical, and then all of a sudden we get much larger run outs. Um, <clears throat> We can vary the other parameters as well. So in this, this plot here, I've also varied the hydraulic permeability, which is a parameter that's, that's next most sensitive to. So each one of these, these dots here is a different simulation. Uh, the, the blue curve is slightly more permeable. Um, the red curve is the same permeability that was used in the, in the previous slides. And uh, the green curve here is less perme permeable. So <clears throat> notice that in all of these, the inundated area for all the three of these different permeabilities is much less than was observed until we cross over into the, the, the contractive cases where the material is slightly looser than the critical solid, solid volume fraction. So in other words, even though the model varies depending on these other parameters, in order to reproduce the, the, uh, reproduce the field evidence, we have to be in this contractive state. So in other words, the model has to support liquefaction to reproduce what was, what was observed. I think this, this red dot here is the, the simulations that were shown previously. And these, these ones with much, much higher runout, the material is staying liquefied and it's essentially behaving like water. It, it, it travels too far. Um, but for, for any permeability, we would not be able to reproduce the runout unless we have liquefaction. Um, so, so now I'll say a, a little bit more about the mathematical model and the software. Um, I, I've decided not to, there, there's no math, uh, so for, for details, of course, you uh, consult our companion papers. Uh, but a few properties of the model uh, are, first of all, it's a depth average shallow flow model, so it's, it's similar to the shallow water equations or the same Venant. Um, however, it's a two-phase model um, with pore pressure evolution. So we have a solid and a fluid phase, and the resulting model is a hyperbolic system of, of five PDEs for these variables, the depth, and I'll say a little more about this, but for a, for a, a two-phase flow, defining the depth of the fluid isn't, uh, it's not trivial, so we're actually modeling a, a virtual depth that where mass below it is conserved, and a graph it in a few more slides will uh, show that more clearly. So we have depth average mixture velocity, so we're actually not modeling uh, two velocity fields for each phase, we're just modeling a single velocity field, so it's a little different than than standard two-phase models in that respect. But we are modeling the solid volume fraction. Um, so we're modeling the volume fractions, and we're modeling the basal pore fluid pressure. 
So in a sense, uh, it's a, it's a two-phase model because of this coupling between the solid volume fraction and the basal pore fluid pressure. Um, so our motivations in, in developing this model, uh, a, a somewhat unique motivation is that we wanted to be able to simulate from initiation to deposition. So we wanted to be able to simulate the whole process. Um, so we want to be able to capture the transition from a stable mass to a flowing debris flow and to see what the fate of a failing mass is. So in other words, if, if you think of a, a slope stability model, that tells you about the force balance, the, the shear strength, and the, the net forces on, the, on a mass. So it, in, those, in the two alternative simulations that were shown earlier, from a slope stability standpoint, they're exactly the same. The, the initial uh, force imbalance leads to a failure. But the difference in those two simulations wouldn't be captured by a slope stability model. So that's what we want to be able to capture with this model, is that flow fate. So what we know that, that this mass might fail, but then what's going to happen? Is it going to have a large degree of run out, or is it going to stabilize? So the way we've tried to accomplish this uh, in the model is by having this co-evolution of the pore fluid pressure and the solid volume fraction. So they're tightly coupled in a feedback mechanism. Um, the pore fluid pressure uh, and the effective stress then evolve, and that changes the shear resistance. So we use an effective stress principle where the Coulomb friction is mediated by the pore fluid pressure. So you can imagine this feedback. Uh, as material begins to shear, that affects the strength. Either, it, uh, either, it's, either the, the strength goes up and it stabilizes, or the friction goes down in it and we get large runout. Um, <clears throat> so here's a, a, a diagram de uh, depicting that. So if we have looser material, material over here, as it shears, it might contract, which would drive up the pore pressure. Or if we have slightly denser material here, as it shears, it, it would tend to dilate, and that would drive down the, the pore fluid pressure and increase the, the frictional resistance. Now, what determines whether our initial material is in a, in a contractive or dilative state, we employ the, the uh, principle of a dilatancy angle um, which is used in, in soil mechanics. Um, so here's the expression we use for our dilatancy angle. It's the difference between the, the ambient solid volume fraction and an equilibrium solid volume fraction, both of which are evolving. So the dilatancy angle is, is evolving as the material flows. Um, if, if, this is, if it's slightly looser than the equilibrium solid volume fraction, we get the contractive case. And when the sign changes, we get the dilative case. Um, <clears throat> So M, M equilibrium is an evolving quantity which depends on this quasi-static uh, critical state solid volume fraction, M crit, but it also depends on the flow variables. And for, for details, you can consult our papers. Um, but initially, the di uh, uh, dilatancy angle is defined by this. So this, this was the quantity that was different in the two initial simulations. Um, now, this, this principle of, of liquefaction and the study of how porosity and liquefaction affect mo mobility has been studied extensively at the USGS debris flow flume. Um, so here's a, a, I think I can get this one. <laughs> um, so here in this experiment, sediment has been uh, uh, deposited in, at the top of the flume. Um, in this case, it was 65 centimeters deep. And this, this here is a, a ramp and retaining wall. Um, and then the material is saturated, allowing the pore pressure to increase. Eventually, the pore pressure reaches some point to where the, 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 the shear resistance can no longer uh, stabilize the flow, and it, and it fails. Um, however, the, so I think I've got time to. So in this particular case, the soil was looser and in a, in a contractive state, and so when the pore pressure reaches the point where there's a failure, you get liquefaction and, and runaway uh, landsliding. And, and this has been extensively tested, so they've done many experiments at the flume where the material, the initial porosity is adjusted, and the resulting behavior has been recorded with, with uh, pressure piezometers and, and uh, um, different instrumentation. And so we've, we've tried to validate the, uh, the, the properties in the model to see if they can reproduce this same behavior. 
So in this case, this is a simulation of an experiment similar to the one that was shown in the video. Um, we initially start with, with zero pore fluid pressure. We then rise the pressure until it uh, reaches failure, and we can adjust the initial porosities and see the different outcomes. Um, so in the, in the, in the uh, simulation when I play it, the blue shading here represents the degree of liquefaction. So you'll see the pore pressure rise. Eventually, it reaches some point uh, where the material fails, and then we want to model what happens in that case. So in this case, it was contractive soil. So the pressure reaches a point where it fails. It begins to contract, liquefy, and we get runaway landsliding. Play it one more time. So does four mean four minutes till questions or four minutes total? OK. Um, now, in, in, the, in the dense soil case, uh, where the material is slightly denser, notice the times here. These are just three snapshots in time at, at uh, zero and 60 seconds. So the pore pressure rose to uh, the same level like before. But the material is essentially slumps and stabilizes. So it's, it can't even be seen in these, in these figures. But the material here has failed slightly, but then it stabilizes. Um, so these are just plots showing those two different cases where we have the pressure, which liquefies, and we get the runaway behavior. Here, if you notice the time scale here, um, the pressure head is decreasing as the material dilates. And if you notice the scales over here, it's, it's just barely moving. Um, so just. Uh, as a last slide, I uh, mentioned the, the software. So Dclaw is the, the software that solves our, our mathematical model. And it's part of the Clawpack software, um, which is freely available open source at clawpack.org. And Clawpack is developed generally for hyperbolic systems. Um, but Dclaw then is an extension of GeoClaw, uh, which uses shot capturing finite volume methods, uh, adaptive mesh refinement, which has been tailored for free surface flows, and also uh, uh, multiple user tools. and it. it uh, accomplishes a robust and accurate integration of multi-resolution DEMs. So we can use many different DEMs at different resolutions, and it will, it will uh, automatically process those. Um, so in conclusion, the, the model results, uh, using the model to, to uh, simulate OSO, uh, shows a bifurcation. And that's that the mobility is strongly dependent on the initial porosity. Um, and for the model to reproduce what was observed, the model needs to be in a state where there's contraction and liquefaction. Uh, the non-contractive sediment uh, leads to much lower mobility than was observed. And with that, I'll answer any questions. We've got two minutes for questions, so. Did we try to compare the deposit uh, depth distribution? Yeah, exactly. uh, we haven't done that yet with OSO. Um, it's something that we, I think we could do. It, just from looking at the simulations, I can tell that the model, a little more mass gets transported out to the, the far front. But, uh, but yeah, we haven't actually done any sort of quantitative comparison yet. Um, well, I think it's, it's thought that entrainment or uh, um, water that was in the soil on the plane actually uh, aided this liquefaction. So I suppose it's possible maybe the, the river could have aided in that liquefaction also. But. Do you have any theories of what unit may have liquefied in the soil? Um, you, yeah, you're probably asking the wrong person about that. But there's probably people in this room that might. Uh, I know there were some clays that have been known to, or some, some clays in the area that were uh, then seen to liquefy in other places. Dick? The, the, the short answer to that is we don't know yet. I mean, we're, work is ongoing in terms of geotechnical testing and so on, but at this point, we can't say with certain which is the most susceptible unit. Okay. What Well, I think it's been suggested that, that some of the slumping from the, the past may have loosened the soil. For, uh, for it to reconsolidate? Yeah. Um, you mean not during the flow 
Um, yeah, I'm not sure I know how to answer that. It's, it, it starts in the looser state, and in the, as it's flowing, it contracts slightly. How could it what? How could it be in this state for a long time? Yeah, maybe. It's actually, it's actually well known in, in geotechnical engineering. I mean, loose, loose soils are far more common than is often recognized. Um, so it's not a particularly unusual condition to find loose, loose of critical soils on hillsides of land. And we are only talking like a 2% difference. I mean, it's. Yeah. 